Oh, I apologize, everybody. Um, I'll start over again. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Due Diligence Lessons Learned from a Serial Healthcare Entrepreneur. My name is Jeff Murphy, and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office, as well as a proud alumnus of the BU Graduate School of Management. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered to our 300,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, the BU Alumni Association is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing, so we very much look forward to receiving your feedback via survey that will be emailed to you later today. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of this presentation, please contact Adobe Connect directly at 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website, which you can find at bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box that you should see at the bottom of your screen. We hope to get to as many questions as we, as we can during today's webinar. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter. Uh, BU Graduate School of Management alumnus Eugene Hill. Eugene is chairman and managing partner of SV Life Sciences, a global venture capital private equity manager focused exclusively on life sciences and healthcare. He joined the company in 1999. He was previously a partner at Excel Partners in Palo Alto, California for five years, where he was responsible for 12 investments in early stage healthcare service and healthcare information technology companies. Since joining SV Life Sciences, he's made 12 healthcare services and healthcare information technology investments. Prior to joining Excel Partners, Eugene held several senior manage management positions, including serving as President of Behavioral Health at United Healthcare Corporation, CEO and President of U.S. Behavioral Health, and President and Chairman of Sierra Health and Life Insurance Company. All told, Eugene has 19 years of operating experience in the U.S. healthcare services market. Uh, Gene, thank you again for being with us today, and the floor is all yours. Well, welcome group from um, Commonwealth Avenue. Unfortunately, a bit rainy today. Uh, some thanks first to uh, Ned Reimer of the Health Program Management uh, Program for urging me to do this and to Jeff Murphy for technologically enabling all this. Um, some biases that I'd like to express before beginning, and that is that, as you see from my background, I've spent about 20 years as an operating executive and about 20 years as an investor. And so I think that those biases will come through in the presentation. And then second, with regard to applicability, while the presentation will focus, uh, as I do, on evaluating investment opportunities, I hope it will be applicable to those of you who are considering in your roles either uh, starting companies, uh, seeking financing for them, or purchasing products and services from other companies that furnish those things, because I think the process of a assessment and evaluation is essentially identical. And then finally, just a footnote, for those of you like myself and Jeff who are proud alums, uh, Bob Brown and uh, Ken Freeman in the School of Management are really doing an exceptional job and we have every reason to be very proud of our legacy. A number of years ago, I tried to put together a summary of the substantive uh, ideas that I, or, or areas that I try and assess when I'm evaluating an investment opportunity or an acquisition. Um, and I've called them the five M's. They start with, um, in my opinion, and it should be the primary assessment of market. Uh, how big is it? How fast is it growing? Uh, are there sub-segments of it that can be uh, analyzed? Uh, who are the entrenched competitors? What are the characteristics of their product, price, promotion, distribution, production strategies? So I start with um, assessing the market opportunity. Once I've, I've assessed the market opportunity, I focus on management. In particular, uh, entrepreneur champions plus the team of people that are going to exploit the identified market opportunity. Um, once I've qualified that the market has sufficiently attractive characteristics in terms of size, growth rate, concentration, um, addressability, 
and accessibility, and I'll distinguish between those two terms uh, because I think they do make a difference. And once I've qualified that the management team at least has the relevant experience and expertise to exploit the market opportunity that's been identified, I try and focus on the methodology or differentiation with which they will design, um, market, price, and promote their products or services to address that market opportunity, which I've characterized or call their methodology. And so in the method, I'm particularly looking at, do they have a distinct competitive advantage? Is it based on a cost benefit? Is it based on a pricing or distribution strategy? Is it based on product or service feature or functions that can differentiate their product or service in the market? Once I've qualified market, management, and methodology, then I focus on the money. How much is it going to take? What are the kinds of uh, financing that they can obtain? And by that I mean uh, very, rain, things ranging from uh, less dilutive sources of financing like government grants or customer advances uh, through uh, debt and equity uh, financing and what the money, so I look at the sources of capital and I look at what it's going to be and the uses, what it's going to be used for and we'll talk about the various components of that and then finally as much as possible, I try and quantify in what I've characterized as the metrics as much as is quantifiable so that I can get a handle, for example, um, in looking at a distribution strategy. Are they going to use a channel or are they going to use direct marketing? If they're going to be using direct marketing, um, is it going to be made use of social media? Um, broadcast advertising, uh, or do they have to mobilize, uh, incent, compensate, and manage a large direct sales force? I ask myself if they're developing a product or service, uh, what the headcount required to do that, uh, whether they have critical um, suppliers that may offer only a single source solution, um, whether or not um, they, you know, it, they will have to distribute through 10 stores, 100 stores, or 1,000 stores. So I'm looking at issues like what is the size of the footprint and cost and revenue yield on a per annum basis of their various sites of delivery or service or how many units of production they need to um, have in order to achieve the economies of scale. So at the highest level, the five M's, which I would really characterize as the substance of the opportunity. In my world today, and I think this is true of most people in the investment uh, world, we're faced with a, you know, a very large number of opportunities. And so on any given day, just to give you some perspective, I receive approximately three to five business plans. And with the ease of electronic communication today, they often come via the internet. So we get a large deal flow, much like I would characterize as drinking from a fire hose. It's pretty easy to triage or qualify a lesser number of projects that we are going to focus on based upon the stage of the business, based upon what we assess as the characteristics of the market opportunity, the experience and expertise of the management team, uh, what the valuation expectations might be. So if in a, if a, a regular year we see 1,500 business plans, we might seriously assess 100. We would probably schedule and review face-to-face uh, -face management presentations with somewhere between 20 and 30 and we'll probably issue 
five to ten term sheets and we usually fund three to five businesses a year. So you can get some sense that there is a lot of times when we say no and I think most people either doing business development for corporations or investors are faced with a large volume of activity that they need to triage and so first question that's usually asked by entrepreneurs is how do I get to the top of the queue and how do I pass through the filter and I would say the, the if you're looking at folks like me the first way you get through it is you come with a validated uh, reference and if in particular you've been a graduate of the Boston University School of Management that would be a good thing to put in the tagline of your uh, email since many of us get north of 500 emails a day just to give you some volume metrics in assessing uh, and, and formulating an approach to assessing businesses I think it's important to determine an attitudinal um, or a psychological mind frame about how to think about things I characterize the four that I believe are probably the most important to investors uh, would be number one be an optimistic skeptic I think if you're going to look at financing innovation which is how I spend most of my time you've got to be an inherent optimist that we're gonna try and find stuff that's gonna both be financially successful as hopefully make a difference in people's lives so it's important to be an optimist but at the same time I think you need to be skeptical um, almost all the entrepreneurs that we meet with on a regular basis are convinced that their idea is going to both improve life on the on the planet Earth as well as generate outsized returns. In point of fact, very few of them will do either. But that doesn't mean we should discourage them. It just means that we need to approach it with an appropriate degree of skepticism. And in my mind, that means trust but verify and we're going to talk a little bit more today about how to in fact verify equally important is the sort of dynamic of both opportunity as well as very real uh, expense issues uh, in the investment um, assessment so you can spend your time on uh, essentially an, a finite number of activities it's important to prioritize and triage those both in terms of how many opportunities you can effectively assess simultaneously and how much you want to spend in both time and dollars in assessing those opportunities and then finally it's been my observation that you should believe little of what you read less of what you hear and only some of what you see some of the lessons that I have experienced over the course of 20 years in business and in investment is that business is cyclic um, and it's important to, to understand within any given market what are the underlying drivers that are influencing the business and, on, and in what cycles uh, do they turn are those cycles predictable and consistent or those cycles inconsistent and very difficult to predict so it's important to understand the basic business drivers and that <clears throat> and where you are in terms of the capital market cycles where you are in terms of sales cycles where you are in terms of product or service development cycles so I think the general thesis <clears throat> is that business is cyclic it's best if you can have a degree of predictability and it's really important to understand where you're at in the cycle so for example in today's business climate <clears throat> there is a very real uh, availability of credit and credit is very inexpensive as a result that tends to drive up the valuation of financial assets since businesses that have operating earnings can place very substantial leverage on those companies at a very low cost that tends to inflate valuations where if we operated in a I would say more normalized credit environment that will tend to suppress valuations because both credit will be more expensive and it may be more scarce I think the second lesson 
that I've taken away from the years in business is that balance sheets in particular, to some degree income statements, and unfortunately accounting are not what they appear, and in fact, unfortunately may not be what you and I experienced in the very fine accounting courses that we took in business school. I would highlight some areas that I think are important to focus on, and they have to do with what I would characterize often as the intangibles. Uh, pension obligations, for those of you involved in that aspect of business, appears to me very much like voodoo accounting. The assumptions that are made um, and the rapidity of change with which those assumptions seem to be issued, and finally their long-term impact make it very difficult to quantify on a less than dynamic basis those things. I focus a lot on a business's cash generation and I look at how its revenue recognition corresponds with its cash realization. I'll talk about that more in a minute. I look at things like inventory because that's an area where I think uh, you get obsolescence and, and it carrying values of inventory or accounting values of inventory may not be their commercial value. Uh, accounts receivable is another area I would say is uh, subject to verification, particularly reserving with regard to aged receivables. Certainly depreciation is another area that I would highlight for your focus because often you find businesses where the depreciable life of an asset is either shorter, the same, or longer than its commercial utility. It's been my experience that there's not always a greater fool. Therefore, if your investment is premised upon there being some greater fool at some, at some later point who's willing to pay more for the fool's gold that you have invested in, I would predict that that will not turn out to be a consistently successful record. And then finally, I think it's important to hope for the best but plan for the worst. The businesses that I see that get in the most difficulty are the businesses that simply have no cushion for what my experience has been, the inevitable something will go wrong. And an adage that I would share with you is that if you invent, invest in haste, you're likely, or it's certainly possible, to repent at your leisure. Because once you've made a financial commitment, um, you're going to live with it until it's either successful, uh, it fails, or it simply becomes uh, the sort of near dead. So how do you triage this wealth of deal flow that, that flows in uh, to your offices on any given day. And so I think there are really five key triage factors that will help you discern how to allocate your time. The first and foremost in my mind is management pedigree. There's a long debate, certainly in the Silicon Valley, about whether management or markets are the key um, thing that you should focus on. Certainly, very exciting markets tend to be like rising tides and benefit all boats that are in the water or can be launched into the water. Um, but my experience has been that markets are a necessary but not a sufficient condition for success. Management, and in particular management teams, have to be organized to exploit those market opportunities successfully. And so I tend to look at management pedigree. Um, what areas of excellence have people or managers established in their prior existence? Um, many people come to business opportunities with formal management and executive training and experience. And obviously things like education and progressive job um, uh, occupancies uh, those are good metrics on success. But I also try and look at whether they've accomplished things outside their managerial or business career and, and been associated both in business and outside of business with excellence. 
because the unfortunate reality is that mediocrity is much more pervasive than excellence. And I think as you look at the business environment in general, you can really see where high quality management and management teams materially differentiate themselves in a business environment that I think is increasingly dominated by what I would characterize as winner take all. So over the 40 years that I've been involved in business and investing, I've observed that market share of the market leading participants has grown materially. Therefore, if you're going to be successful in a product or service, it's necessary to initially acquire what I'll characterize as mind share, and then subsequently I think that leads to market share leadership, and that takes people to execute upon that. The second thing in terms of triage is where did the deal come from? The practical reality is that when you receive the number of investment opportunities that most of us receive, it's simply, you simply have to prioritize them. There's only a limited amount of time. That's the finite resource. So I look at where the business plan came from. Things like successful prior entrepreneurs, successful previous uh, business executives are good places to, to start in terms of where you should prioritize. Um, stuff that simply comes in over the transom, unintroduced, probably should go to the bottom of the pile. Uh, professional consultants and advisors would be another example of, I would say, good deal sources. Other thing that I've learned over time is to assess how a management team manages the process. We often encounter entrepreneurs who have an innovative idea, who really haven't been exposed to venture capital or private equity. Our time is limited. If they haven't been exposed to folks like us before, frankly, I cut them a little slack. If they have been exposed to folks like me before, I think I'm going to want them to preemptively address in the form of a cogent business plan and a cogent management presentation, preemptively address and answer many of the questions that it's likely that I'll raise. Customer validation is, and by that I mean external customer validation, is probably one of the single most important triage factors in terms of assessing in the vernacular whether the dogs are going to eat the dog food. And then finally, it's been our observation that management teams that really know their markets will adhere to their plans. So in terms of, um, and I'll go back real quick, uh, key focus areas, I try and look at what the major risk factors are. Can the product be um, patented, in which case it would give you intellectual property protection? Uh, are there obvious showstoppers, like you've got a single source supplier or your key distribution channel already has an exclusive arrangement with your competitor? And I assess whether or not we're dealing with what I would characterize as better, faster, cheaper, or brave new world. The key difference there is that better, faster, cheaper has a reference point. You can determine what the product and pricing and distribution and margin characteristics of the market today. The problem with Brave New World, it's a bit like Indiana Jones. You have to make a leap of faith because you don't know the size, growth rate, pricing, distribution characteristics of the market. In terms of major risk factors, I tend to look at things like, is there a technological hurdle? Can the product or service actually be produced? I look at what the characteristics are the, of the market are in terms of the affordability price point distribution. I look at whether there's a regulatory, a hurdle or impediment. Often regulatory can be an enabler. Uh, for example, the necessity of approval by the Federal Drug Administration to commercialize a pharmaceutical in the United States becomes a very significant barrier to entry 
But once you're through that barrier, you often get a very material advantage vis-a-vis -vis competitors. I ask myself as an operator, can the product or service be operationalized? And then finally, can it be financed? And can it be financed on reasonable terms? Back to the market, I tend to look at things on the macro side, like the size, growth rate, concentration, and barriers to entry. And then I tend to focus on the micro side of the economics of the business, looking particularly at pricing, whether the business or service is a price taker or a price giver, what their operating margins are, who their customers are, and finally, if I can segment within the in business areas that are more or less attractive. In terms of management, I tend to look at whether the management has a vision for what they want to accomplish. And we can talk a little bit later about, I try and balance what I would characterize as a combination of missionary and mercenary, looking for people who have a vision about a mission and want to make a difference, but in order to yield a substantial financial return, I'm looking for people that have a sufficient mercenary characteristic. If those two things are held approximately in balance, I think it tends to work well. Where one is unbalanced, I think it tends to be quite problematic. I look at experience, and with regard to experience, I try and assess the quality of the experience, the quantity of the experience, and the relevancy of the experience. I do look at education, because I think education is a combination of a meritocracy in terms of progression. It's, a, it's an area that is quantitated in terms of grade point average and quality of school that people go to. Um, and it indicates a degree of, of, of perseverance and, and discipline for people who you know, are willing to invest their time and their financials in order to acquire education. I look at their track record. People often ask me, is having failed previously fatal? And the answer is no, unless it's a serial event. And by that, I mean someone who does it more than once or twice. And then secondly, it's important to assess if they have failed, why they failed. It may have had almost nothing to do with the individual or their strategy. It might be some external environment, such as the financial crisis, that you couldn't have predicted and or uh, you were victimized by. Importantly as well, people who've been very successful um, it may have been the result of blind luck. And so it's important to understand why they either succeeded or failed and what they have learned from that. And then finally, I tend to distinguish between what I would call capability and ability. Uh, there are a lot of individuals who have the native intelligence, uh, drive, work ethic, and all those things. So they're able, but they often fail to, oper you know, to sort of operationalize those native qualities. And so I distinguish that by characterizing it as capability. On the methodology side, the first thing I ask myself is what is the business model? First and foremost, is it a product or is it a service? In today's world, it is possible to sell products as services through the concept of cloud-based you know, software as service type models. So you, can have, you, you end up with things that are not purely product or services as we've had historically. I ask myself whether the business is going to be built by acquiring other businesses or whether it's going to be built through de novo uh, development. I ask myself, what is the value proposition? Is it lower cost? better feature functions, um, and to whom does this value proposition accrue? And my experience is if the valuation, if the value proposition does not directly accrue to the person writing the check, the degrees of distance you are from that person writing the check and the value proposition is probably going to make the sale incrementally more difficult always ask myself, what is the distribution strategy? 
Is it through a channel or is it direct? Is it a B to C, in other words, business to consumer, or B to B, business to business model? And what's the competitive differentiation? What's the special sauce? Why are this? Why is this opportunity going to succeed when others may not? What's the growth strategy? How rapid is it, and what does it require? If it's a business that you, in order, you, you've got populations in, measured in the millions to address, that requires a very different strategy than a business that can maybe target, you know, a hundred potential customers that you can, you know, maintain in a list. And then finally, is the technology actually doable? In terms of the money, I look at the finance strategy. What kind of funds they're going to be and where are you going to get them? And I look at capital requirements and how much bricks and mortar you have to invest in in terms of plant and, and capital equipment, things that can be financed with asset-backed financing like debt, and how much working capital is going to be required in order to build the product or service. I look at the structure, how much of the business can be leveraged, how much of the business requires equity financing. I look at valuation, and I look at both what the valuation is on an entry point and what the valuation might be at the end. And I always ask myself, what is my liquidity path? If this business is going to be successful, in the end, how am I going to get my proceeds back so that I can recycle them into the next opportunity? And finally, what are they going to use the proceeds for? Is it to cash out the existing owners? or is it to finance new business development? There are a number of metrics that I'm going to go over very quickly in the interest of time because I want to leave time for questions, but suffice to say, I focus on the income statement, specifically revenue projections, what are the dollars, how many units, the average sale price, expense projections in terms of headcount, salary level, particularly corporate overhead, and what kind of gross and operating margins exist. On the balance sheet, I tend to look at things like cash, accounts receivable, inventory, goodwill and intangibles, debt, and other liabilities. I focus very specifically on both the operating and financial cash flow. Where there are where there's history, I try and look at how, whether they've achieved their budgets in terms of determining their realization. And then finally, look at the capitalization table in terms of how much the investors will own, whether there's an appropriate allocation of management, and if not, we try and make sure that there's an appropriate option or equity incentive arrangement because we try and align as much as possible management with the investor interest so that we do well together. In terms of process, the first start in it is to really get a business plan and review it, and if it's attractive, to schedule a management presentation. Subsequently followed to the degree that there are sites of operation, to site visits, uh, determining references on both the business opportunity as well as management, performing both competitive and financial analysis, and conducting a corporate review. In terms of business plan, we've talked a lot about the substance, but I think form is important too, because if businesses are going to be successful, management teams to be, need to be able to make a coherent presentation. And so they need to be able to distill in a relatively small amount of time their vision, the business model, the marketing technology, and financial plans. That doesn't require going to double decimal uh, level of detail on the financial projections. And, it's not, and if it's not something that can't be digested by a reasonably attention deficit disordered person such as myself in a, about an hour, it's probably too much. Um, I've developed a whole venture capital glossary. This has really provided more for your humor, but you'll be surprised at quite often how accurate this really turns out to be where things like basically on plan translate into a revenue shortfall of about 25%. Considerably ahead of plan really means that they hit plan in one of the last three months. At any rate, I'll go through these quickly. Long selling cycle might be they've yet to find a customer who likes the product or service. And then finally, I've got a series of VC terminologies 
that also provides some humor for you. But again, you'd be quite amazed at how many of these are fairly consistent with life as I live it. Um, and I'm going to focus now on management attributes because it's very important in my experience to match the stage of the business with the key attributes of management. It has also been my experience that if you invest in a business from a startup through a public offering potentially or a mature business, it is highly unlikely that the chief executive officer and many members of the senior team are going to be able to navigate a multi-year journey you know, from startup through a more mature business. And so it's important to know where you are in terms of the maturity of the business and match the focus and the key attributes of the management with that stage. So for example, in startups, the focus really needs to be on development. And the attributes that I seek are passion and vision. We're an early stage business. We're really looking to get those first key customers. So you need sort of a beachhead or an entry or a pilot. And in, and in order to get that, you really need people whose attributes are persistency and tenacity because they're going to get turned down a lot. In later stage businesses, in contrast, where the focus needs to be market penetration, <laughs> you need people and operators that can develop replicable, scalable systems and processes that can generate positive cash flow, which enable you to finance both your existing business as well as your new innovations. It's been my experience that pipeline is a very important way of assessing the viability of the business, but people use semantics and they mean different things. So over the years, I've developed my own. I characterize a suspect as a potential prospect, a prospect as a suspect with whom contact has been made, a qualified prospect is a potential customer with a budget, actively seeking a solution, and finally, a customer as a contractually committed, financially viable client. And so I ask management teams to organize their pipeline by these categories so I can really determine what the pipeline is. Equally, it's necessary to do, in addition to a financial review, a technology review. So I look at things like what is the architecture on what operating system it's based? What kind of relational database and application code and development environments are used? I look at what the resources, both human as well as financial capital, they're going to be required to build the technology and whether they're going to outsource or insource or use a combination of those things. And I look at the track record of the people doing it. Have they delivered on time and on budget and how many times? And in terms of today's world, is this something that's looking to transform businesses or are they simply using social media for advertising and promotion? In terms of technology review, very much like the pipeline qualification, it's been my experience that people use words, but they mean things different than I have. So over time, I've developed my own semantics. which is, And so I characterize a pre-alpha as a concept that's in somebody's mind, whereas an alpha stage, it works in a development laboratory. A beta is usually a product or service that's installed in a production environment and it's reasonably or partially feature function complete. Any first customer release is a fairly debugged, well-defined feature function product that is shipping to paying customers who are using it in their production environments. Um, it, we've talked a bit about management in terms of their, their ability to be articulate and to be able to communicate a cogent strategy. Because in order to be successful, to recruit other people to their vision, both employees and customers, it's necessary, I think, for people to be able to be articulate and for their story to hang together. I myself, among the things that I enjoy most about what I do, enjoy me conducting site visits, 
It is important, in my opinion, to visit both headquarters and outlets if they exist. And I try and get a sense of first impression because among the things that I'm attempting to assess is what is the organizational culture. Obviously, if you're investing in a high-tech business, for example, you would like to see people that have um, both very good technology. If, for example, if you're investing in a high-tech pharmaceutical business, you'd expect to see people who are working with very fine laboratory instruments in clean environments. I would say the same is partially true for people developing software. You'd want to see them using very modern equipment. If, however, you observe and, and startup businesses, you would not want to see, you know, located in a very high cost real estate, having spent their money, you know, on, um, you know, office and, and space that, that is probably beyond their means. That doesn't, so I'm trying to get a sense from both first impression um, as well as what is the culture itself in the business. I conduct a lot of references. I try and do 360 degree references in terms of former employees, bosses, peers, direct reports, board members, advisors. I also call competitors when possible. And if they've been uh, in businesses that have external analysis, I look for those. I look at customers, both current customers, if there are former customers, and prospective customers. And then I talk to their advisors, if there are auditors, or lawyers, or bankers, or other investors, I make calls to those kind of people. And I conduct a competitive analysis where I first look at who owns the market today and how it's carved up. Is it highly concentrated? Is it very fragmented? Um, and I look at the participants and whether they are old tired firms with you know, arcane or sunsetting technology or services, or are they fantastic innovators with cutting edge products and services they are going to be difficult to compete against. It's been my experience, as I said earlier, that mind share often leads to market share. So it's important to distinguish those things. And I talked a bit earlier about this differentiation between addressable market and accessible market. So a, an addressable market might be 100% of the market. Um, and if a market is underpenetrated, might represent the underpenetrated percentage. But what I've often learned is that an, the accessibility of that mark, market opportunity may be impeded by inadequate financial resources, high cost uh, distribution and acquisition, things of that nature. And so I tend to focus more on what the accessible market is. Momentum, especially in today's world, often leads through mind share to market share. And I look at how competitors are differentiating themselves in the market. What is the buyer motivation? At the most basic level, is it a painkiller, something that someone has to have, or is it a vitam? something that would be nice to have but is not essential. We've talked earlier about sales cycle and I focus extensively on pricing. I'm going to skip over the valley of death in the interest of time but I just wanted to focus a little bit here on the ASP pricing model because over time in the technology arena as we've converted to a software a service model that has enabled us to expand the addressable market opportunity because we have materially reduced the financial barrier to adoption, which in often in business cases has enabled us to sell to businesses that historically didn't have as much organizational size or financial resources. On the financial analysis, I look at things such as the actual, how they performed actually versus plan, their sales pipeline, how much operating and financial leverage the business has, in terms of competition, how much operating margin they have or how much are they spending on research and development, how are they distributing and how much is it costing, what their average sale price is. I look at valuation and I look at returns both in terms of absolute dollars and internal rates of return. In terms of a corporate review, I'll skip over this quickly in the interest of time, but I typically want to read both the audit and a management letter if it exists. I want to do a legal review in terms of 
historic lawsuits, licensing agreement, distribution agreements, employee contracts, employee benefits, shareholder agreements, financing agreements, customer contracts. I'm interested in regulatory environments such as licensures, regulatory and environmental approvals. I look at intellectual property. I look at the insurance uh, provisions. And finally, I look at leases for real estate and capital equipment. In terms of the deal, obviously, you try and start with a term sheet. Make sure that if you're purchasing something, the other side as well as yourself has adequate legal representation. I go through the document preparation, close the deal, and then I conduct a post-closing review to make sure that I haven't left anything out. So some tips, to do's. Always conduct site visits of both corporate and regional offices, and it's a good idea to arrive early. You can get a, learn a lot by just being hanging around. My experience is to, I love to visit uh, cafeterias. You can learn an awful lot in stairwells and bathrooms. I try and tour with junior staff whenever possible because they don't know what not to tell you. I try and meet with the worker bees in addition to the managements, and I want to see a production environment, not just the development laboratory, and I ask a ton of questions. In terms of don'ts, don't mistake development for production. Don't visit only the corporate staff. Don't discuss anything in elevators or bathrooms. Never leave your file or your laptop or your tablet unattended. Never sign the visitor log if you can avoid it. Try and avoid leading the witness. Don't volunteer competitive information, but always seek it. Don't breach either the moral or written obligation of confidentiality. And finally, don't assume that you can structure your way to a good investment. It's my experience that you can structure your way to an improved return. You cannot structure your way to a good investment. A number of years ago, the social scientist actually performed a series of studies to determine what human capital assessment techniques were the most successful. And they characterized them as they do in four generic categories, which obviously aren't meant to be perfect. One was the art critic, the person who knows beauty and can determine it on the basis of some sort of subjective assessment. There's a sponge. That's a person who seeks to collect as much information as possible and discern through that what's best. There's the prosecutor. That sort of is the fry them in the hot oil technique and see who survives that bath by fire. And then finally, there, there is what they determined was the airline captain methodology, which, which is much more like a checklist that you should have reason to expect your pilot is going to go through before he flies 300 people across the United States at 30,000 feet. Not surprisingly, the airline captain technique has been proven through quantitative studies to produce better rates of return. And so I choose that as the metaphor for the best way to assess people. We've talked a little bit about this notion of the management orientation and making sure you've got an appropriate balance of missionary and mercenary. And then finally, in terms of looking at an innovation adoption life cycle, this is a chart I've borrowed from Jeff Moore. Many of you who've read a book called Crossing the Chasm or Inside the Tornado know that this has proven to be a pretty good model of adoption of technology, but I think it's relevant to many products and services. And it's really important to understand where you are in terms of market penetration and over what period it's measured. Obviously, depending on valuation, the very best place to invest in this chart would be after the business or service has crossed the chasm, is beginning to get early adoption, because that's the period of time when the most market share growth is going to be realized. And often that translates into the maximum financial return, um, as opposed to if you're way too early it takes too much development time to gain minimal market share. And if you're too late, you don't get the benefit of the high growth that generates generally the highest values. In terms of adoption, it's important to understand both what is driving it, economic, regulatory, psychological, and demand factors, and what's enabling or inhibiting it in terms of financial, regulatory, technological, or standardization.
Um, disruptive technology paradigms, I think you all are well familiar with Gordon Moore and the notion of Moore's Law, which is a speed and, co and cost inverse relationship in terms of the semiconductor industry, but also um, Bob Metcalf, you know, who was the, uh, one of the founders of Ethernet, um, talked about network effectiveness and the benefit of, of networks, and you're seeing that today in the social media. So that's my mission today. I'd be delighted to uh, have the time remaining for you to direct any questions uh, to me. So thanks again for taking time out of your busy lives to uh, allow me to share with you some of the lessons and experience that I've had. And I'll turn it over, Jeff, to uh, questions. Great, Gene. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, um, some of you were raising your hands to ask questions. I would ask, actually ask that you please just actually use the Q&A chat box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, Gene, we do have a, a couple questions rolling in. Uh, first one is from Noah, uh, and he's wondering if when you look at um, investing in a business, what level of FDA diligence do you undertake? Do you use FDA regulatory lawyers to help evaluate the company um, you know, in all states of the company life cycle? Uh, early expansion or late stage. So it's a it's a there are a series of questions embedded in that, and I would say um, it depends on the stage of the business. So I'll, I'll go to the extremes to give you the 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 barbells. Um, and if it's a, a business that's already approved by the FDA and is selling commercial product, I would I would have a, a series of reviews that would start with intellectual property and continue through. Uh, reviewing any of the um, FDA filings and uh, up to and, and uh, involved in potential hiring consultants to go out and actually look at the production environment, review whether the uh, FDA has inspected the plant, whether there are any 483s uh, that have been issued, whether or not they are in compliance with GMP or GLP, depending on where they are in the process. That would be the extreme side of a company that's already um, selling a regulatory approved commercial product on the opposite side of the development curve. So if we're looking at a company who are a scientific innovation uh, that would subsequently require uh, FDA approval, we would often seek uh, to um, look at comparable uh, products or service or products in the market and what what their regulatory pathway has been, um, how long, how large the studies have been required, how long it takes to conduct those studies, um, what kind of uh, difference between a baseline is necessary to establish uh, proof of concept, things like that. Does that help? Yeah, I, I think definitely, Gene. Thank you. Um, Joaquin has asked an interesting question. Um, he's wondering how crowdfunding has affected your business, if at all. I think crowdfunding is a great innovation. Um, on the one side of it, I guess I worry that um, it's susceptible to some degree to uh, the madness of the crowd phenomenon. Um, so that would be the pejorative a concern, and that is that you potentially have people um, who don't have sufficient either experience or knowledge to assess a technology or service and or uh, determine valuation. On the other side, and the, and the much more positive side of it, I think it's a great new vehicle for innovation to be financed. Um, in terms of how it's affected the, per, you know, sort of institutionalized venture capital business, I think only in a modest way. But I don't think we, I think we're in very, er, in the very early innings of crowdfunding. It's a trend that I follow with great interest and uh, one in which I've participated personally on two occasions uh, just to see what it's like. Uh, so I think it's a, a great new innovation. Uh, I'm hopeful that it will prove successful. Um, I think it's been enabled by the relaxation of some of the um, SEC constraints, um, which I think uh, may or may not prove to be a good idea. Great. Thanks, Gene. We have a number of questions rolling in here. Um, Patrick has uh, checked in with a couple, and I'll ask um, his first one. Uh, Patrick's asking, with the money in, can you comment on the control to investment relationship and influence on strategy, growth, direction, and et cetera of the company? It's a great question. 
Um, and, and I think that um, the way to, the, I think that successful investors are able to turn to determine the best way to be helpful with a management team. It's rarely to try and substitute yourself for management. I think the areas that we tend to hope that we can be the most influential in is in terms of helping to serve as a um, second opinion on strategy, especially with regard to product service and financing. Um, but there's a fine balance. I, I liken it to um, we need to sort of play the role, if you will, of the orchestra uh, conductor, uh, where we're not expected to be experts in playing uh, any given instrument. We just have to make sure that the symphony uh, comes across well. And, and importantly, we need to make sure that we're doing whatever we can uh, for the individual performers uh, to exhibit their, their best. Um, so where I think things get uh, in trouble is when investors try and substitute themselves or, or substitute their judgment uh, for management, where management is often both living it on a 24, 365-day basis, as well as, frankly, are, are better informed because they're closer to the market. Great. And we've got another question from a, a friend of mine, actually, a guy named Chris. Uh, Chris is wondering if you could let him know, to what extent do you utilize outside consultants to vet a business during the discovery process? Um, you know, what, what types of work do you do to keep internal um, versus utilizing a consultancy? The, the quick answer is, again, depending on the stage of the business and depending on the nature of the business, we make fairly extensive use of consultants. So let me offer um, a couple of extremes. Um, if we're looking at a leverage buyout of an existing business, uh, we would undoubtedly engage um, professional uh, auditors to perform things like a quality of earnings assessment. We might engage a consulting firm um, to both assess the market opportunity as well as the, do a competitive analysis. We would certainly, as I talked earlier, uh, engage uh, legal representation. And um, we would also look for um, you know, key opinion leaders uh, to help assess it. If it's a, a much more earlier stage um, product or service opportunity, we would often, uh, in terms of technologic review, uh, bring in folks that had information technology uh, expertise. If it was a scientific innovation, we would try and identify um, you know, key opinion leaders, scientists who could help us with the um, scientific uh, assessment of its feasibility and its viability. Thank you, Gene. We have a number of other questions, but I, I want to try to be respectful of everybody's time. There's one I want to address. Uh, a couple people have um, chatted in wondering uh, where they can see a recording of this presentation. Uh, and again, you in a couple days, give me uh, two to three days to get this up on our website, but you'll be able to find the recording of this presentation at bu.edu backslash alumni backslash webinars. Um, and I will, um, in the survey email you get today, I'll, I'll include a link to that library where you can keep an eye uh, for this presentation. Gene, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I think this was a really interesting presentation on a number of levels and um, was quite an amazing model that you've, you've shared with everybody uh, who tuned in today. So, so thank you again. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us and uh, keep BU in your hearts and minds. That's great. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today as well, um, and I hope that you'll plan to join us for our first webinar in 2015. Um, I can't believe I'm saying that. Uh, but in January, on January 14th, we'll have a session uh, titled How to Use BU Career Beam to Advance Your Career. Uh, BU Career Beam is one of the most robust tools that we offer to our alumni in terms of career support, uh, and that'll be a great in-depth exploration for anybody who's thinking about maybe making a job change or looking for a new job in 2015. That'll be a session to definitely circle on your calendar. Um, you can sign up for that session and all of our other webinars uh, now on our website at bu.edu slash alumni. And as always, if you or any BU alumni you know would like to volunteer your time just like Gene has done here, um, I'd ask that you please contact me uh, to discuss presenting a webinar. Uh, and you, you're welcome to email me directly 
at JT Murphy, that's J, uh, T as in Thomas Murphy at BU.edu, or just contact me at the Alumni Relations Office. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for tuning in today. I hope you have a great day or a great evening, wherever you might be. Take care.